Museum of History Studios. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, special episode of uh, AG Today. It is, uh, what is today's date? The 7th of February, and we have our friend Chris Gwynn with us. That is kind of a tongued twister of a name. It is, yeah. So when you go with the, the one syllable for the, the first and last name. Let me try it. They tend to blend Christopher together. Christopher Gwynn. Oh, yeah. That's easier. Sorry, okay. <laughs> Thank you, man. Uh, he's here uh, as he as he uh, tends to do a uh, couple times a year when we can remember to do it. We've, we've missed a couple seasons, but we want to give you a preview uh, of uh, what you can expect from uh, the Park Service with interpretive programming this spring of 2024. And uh, Chris, thank you for coming back in and doing this. As always, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the uh, the invitation to talk about this. I appreciate it. Anytime, anytime. Now, Christopher, let's start with uh, the thing that's on everybody's mind. Even though the park has put word out, we're going to ask you again, because I'm sure it's going to be in the comment section or it's going to be in the phone calls if anybody calls in. By the way, if you want to call in, 717-420-1978 is the phone number. Call in, ask Chris any question that you want. Ah, uh, well, not any question, you know, within reason. Uh, what is the deal with Little Round Top? When is it going to open? Do we have a date yet? What's what's the story? Go. So we're eyeing late spring, early summer. Okay. Yeah. And it's, you know, a lot of the work that they're doing up there, one, it's handwork, and it's very weather dependent, right? And so, you I mean, you can't pour concrete when it's raining. You can't lay asphalt when the, the, the atmospheric conditions aren't right. So a right. lot of it is, is weather dependent, but... You know, for those folks who've been, you know, waiting for Little Round Top to reopen, it's been almost two years. Like the end is in sight. So yeah. you, can, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. You're approaching the finish line, and you know it's um, it's a project that has to be done right. It has to be done correctly, and it's going to take as long as it's going to take. But again, we are eyeing that late spring, early summer uh, deadline. We're actively planning for the reopening. It so. is kind of uh, hard to believe, though, that it's been two years. Been almost two years. Yeah, I mean, it's like a year and a half. Almost I mean, two years. It's well, it's over a year and a half, isn't over it? Over a year and a half. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. We closed. I want to say late July of two years ago. Yeah. So I mean, that, just that, shy of just shy of two years when when hopefully we reopen. That really did go fast. Man, when you think about the amount of work that was involved from the contractors, from the archaeological perspective, from I mean, you name it. It was a it's a it's a tremendous tremendous undertaking. And, you know, the, the sensitivity of the landscape, mm -hmm. and all those things, um, they, they factor into it. Yeah. And it's, um, uh, I mean, of course, I understand, uh, you know, a lot of people, there's some people, you know, who only come here to go up there, I found. Yeah. Which, which kind of surprises yeah. me, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, so those people will be coming back. Uh, I, I think it's going to be, I, what do you think? I, I think people are going to really like it. I think, oh, oh you, you never, you never, so you're never going to please everybody. Of course so you, not. You need to, you need to go into anything like this with that mindset, especially Gettysburg and Gettysburg is a very unique ecosystem. And for someone who works in, in the park service or in, in my position, it's a, it's a really wonderful place to work because you have so many people who are so invested in, in the park and the place. And that's, you know. I've worked at parks where that doesn't exist, mm. right? Where yeah, it's yeah. really difficult to get uh, to get um, a kind of community and a, you know to build this sense of stewardship up amongst the people uh, that you know, they might come to the park. And Gettysburg doesn't have that. It, and if anything, it's it's the opposite of that. Where you have so many people who love this place so deeply, who care about it so much that um, you know they're they're going to be engaged with this process, and that's you know it's a wonderful thing. But at the same time, again, not everybody is going to be happy all the time. But from the Park Service perspective, you know, we do the best we can mm -hmm. to, to one, preserve, protect, to be very sensitive to the landscape that we're, that we're working on. Little Round Top is, is a singular place. There's only one. You can't mess it up, right? You <laughs> right. cannot mess it up. No, you don't want to mess yeah, it up. Yeah, at the same time, not, you know, they, it's going to be a different parking configuration than visitors are used to, uh, you know. I've seen a lot of the kind of the Facebook chatter about yeah, some yeah. of the 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 um you know, the elements on the hill, and I think from a from a certain perspective, there's there's a a, a group of folks that um, they have this this conception that after the battle ended, you know, on July fifth, eighteen sixty three, this little bubble <laughs> came down from the heavens and <laughs> was placed over Little Round Top, right. and it's just it's been preserved, been preserved, untouched, yeah. right? You know, for a hundred and and you know sixty years. 
you know, the reality is that that hill has been in a constant state mm. of evolution since July 2nd, 1863, and even before. So it's not a static landscape. Right. It's been constantly evolving. You can see, if you look at pictures taken after the Battle of it, you can, if you look closely, you can see that the topography of the top of the hill is not the same as what it is today. And I guess, did we not know that the 44th New York was on Phil? Well, we didn't know until we started to do archaeological work on it. And that's so, true. So we didn't know going into that that it was on Phil. No, um, well, certainly I didn't know. Okay, I mean, maybe somewhere somebody knew, but certainly the contractors didn't know. The park staff didn't know. It makes sense. I mean, you're building this, you know, this castle on top of the hill, right? <laughs> right. And so um, there was what we call this void um, underneath the monument that had to be that had to be corrected because again, it's just built on Phil. Right. And you know, our, our archaeological team went in and they actually um, they uncovered what they think I, I'm going to butcher the term, but they call it the horizon level. So it's basically the 1863 topography that was underneath all that fell. And they Got found it. battle-related artifacts down there, which is fascinating. Yeah. But so the hill's been, it's been messed with quite a bit, right? So you have the, the GBMA, they're going to restack a lot of those defensive works. You have the War Department that comes in in 1895, and then just before they're going to build a lot of the avenues. There's a tremendous amount of development that takes place, especially on the southern face of the hill and on the eastern slopes of the hill. Everything from, you know, a, a relic shop to a there's a merry-go-round, or a carousel, and a, the Round Top Park Pavilion, and just the National Park Service comes in, especially in the 1950s, reconfigures the uh, War Department alignment of Sykes Avenue. They basically blast out the side and create the parking lot that everybody remembers. And you can go in on some of the rocks. You can, you know, you can see where they bore through the the granite of the. You uh, talking about up diabase. top? Up top, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the Park Service did that, right? And so it, it, the hill has been through a lot of of stages and evolution and you well, know and that path that we walk on up there was once drivable you could take your little model t up you, there you couldn't would, you the, the avenue was literally on top of of the crest of the hill right so right. You're, you're driving right past the 44th new york and so <laughs> it's a, i can't even imagine that yeah, yeah. so when visitors um you know again on social media or or elsewhere comment about how you know that we're modifying the hill and you know blah 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 I, I think that comes from a, 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 a lack of understanding of how much the hill has gone through in, in 160 years. Yeah. Again, a constant, unending state of, of change and evolution that has occurred there. And so you need to take that into, so for example, we're building bus parking uh, on the summit where the parking area currently is. Right. There's a retaining wall that's there to help to help accommodate that. And uh, you know, it's, it's obviously um, something that's gonna be new Mm -hmm. When visitors see it, it serves a purpose. It's um, you know, certainly not an 1863 feature, but that's hardly the first iteration of of change that has happened right. to the hill since 1863. I think uh, a lot of people focus on the battle history uh, primarily yeah. or solely, and yeah. they don't take into account park history. I, I mean, I got to admit that before I started doing the show, I never even considered park history. And if you had, you know, brought it up to me prior to doing Addressing Gettysburg, I would have been like, meh, I don't really care about that. Yeah. But now, like, I find it more and more interesting. And it was funny. It was on a, it was on a battle walk with yeah. Troy Harmon out um, by the Cops of Trees, and he sure. pointed out Webb Avenue, the old oh, road base. still see the grass yeah. is a different yes. color. Yeah. If you ever go on Google Earth, you can go and see all these avenues that are once in the park. Exactly. Yeah. And and then it was that was the moment that kind of made my brain tingle yeah. and I suddenly became with old park or became obsessed with old park roads yeah. that are no longer there, but right <laughs> under your nose. It's there. If it's, it's right there. there. And yeah. and I've always noticed the different color yeah. grass, but I never put two and two together. So, go ahead. To go back to Little Round Top. So, you know, a lot of the the trail alignments that'll be up on the hill, they're actually we're, they're on top of old avenue alignments. So we're using uh, basically circulation systems that existed in the 1890s, but now uh, we're reutilizing the same disturbed area for some of the paths that'll be up there. And then I want to get back to your point about, about the battle. Yeah. Right, about the battle. One of the um, you know, core aspects of this project, as far as you know, my shop is concerned, is doing a better job of, of guiding visitors through the story of the battle on the hill so that visitors will understand how to explore Little Round Top. Now, that's not going to apply to most of your listeners who are well-versed in the battle. They know the story, but increasingly, we're getting a lot of visitors who will go to the Little Round Top, and they might admire the beautiful view mm -hmm. and the sweeping vistas of the battlefield, 
but they really don't understand how the battle itself unfolded. So a lot of the trail systems now are going to take you to where a lot of the battle action occurred. So, for example, there's a you know a trail that'll take you down past the Vincent Wounding Marker to the 16th right. of Michigan, and then all the way down the slope to uh, really Devil's Den. So when you hike that from the den up the hill, you're really following the route of the 4th Texas mm -hmm. salt on Little Round Top. So that's an experience that um, had been a kind of a social trail, but we had never really formalized it. So there'd be uh, experiences like that that you can have. We're working diligently right now on the interpretive signage that'll be up on the hill. And again, the intent is we're going to use these interpretive panels to do a better job of telling you the story of the battle from the moment uh, the signal station arrives on the hill and, and of course, Warren... Warren uh, goes up the slopes to uh, to the charge of the 20th of May. I think uh, overall the vast majority of people will appreciate the uh, changes because they're not uh, – it's not completely different. Oh, no. You I mean, it's still – you can still walk it the way you used to, except now you won't twist your ankle going down to the 83rd you Pennsylvania. Know, if anything, you'll have a much – I hope that you have a much better time, <laughs> right? Because right? there's a trail going down to the 83rd Pennsylvania. Right. There's – um. There's a uh, you know, there's for example a trail to the Michigan Sharpshooters Monument, which has all been inaccessible. Before. Never been down there until Super Steve awesome. Sims took Super me there. Super awesome. Yeah. Super awesome. Well, right, and so I think that's the thing that it it just shores up things that people kind of created on uh, their own, and it, but it makes it more uh, accessible for sure. people who might not be so sturdy on their feet and they can't Absolutely. go off rough ground. These trails are different, and. I, I I think the top of the hill, of course, that's where most people are going to go. Sure. You know, it. when I was up there in October, I was trying to remember what it looked like before all the work. Yeah. So, you know, I've already forgotten basically what it used to look like up there. Well, I think that's a good thing because especially, the, especially that core interpretive area, which is, you know, basically we're defining it as everything from Warren down to the, um, the 44th New York. Uh, there was a lot of architecture, for lack of a better word. So park created architecture and infrastructure that really dates from the 1950s. So that little, uh, I'll call it, I don't know if I call it a paddock or a little, uh, so that pavilion, that little, um, it was right by the 91st Pennsylvania. We had some interpretive signs, yeah, yeah, a little yeah. retaining wall stone. So that, we, we took all that out and what we left was that 1863 topography below, including this giant boulder that's about the size of this room. Right, right. That you can see in early Tipton photos and early postcards and uh, you know, we had just assumed that it had been blasted away and gone, but it was, it was still there underneath. Up. It was still yeah. underneath this, you know, 1950s, uh, you know, Mission 66 era park service, you know, infrastructure. Right. And so we're actually, with this project, we've revealed some of that 1863 layer that had previously been hidden. And, you know, w with the trails and with the desire for when, when people go to Little Round Top at a fundamental level, I think that they're looking to connect with something that's that's real, mm. Right. Because you can read about Little Round Top in a book. You can read, you know, The Killer Angels or Joshua Chamberlain's, you know, Through Blood and Fire at Gettysburg or, you know, the accounts of, of, of the other men that fought there. And it's it's very, um, it's, uh, it's I won't say it's cerebral, but it's it's not the real thing. But when you go to Little Round Top and you see the same rocks and you can walk the same terrain, it takes something that's an abstract and makes it something that's real. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go to church, you want to pray in the chapel and not in the parking lot. People want, <laughs> right. they want to have that experience yeah, yeah, being on yeah. there. And I think what we've done ultimately with this project is hopefully made that better, certainly safer for you, the visitors, also, and also for the, the park, for the, the defensive works that, that were left behind by the soldiers, for the monuments, uh, for the landscape itself. So that's my hope. And again, we're eyeing late spring, early summer for that. And I think that the uh, the park has uh, succeeded in that, and I think I so. most people will agree with that. I, so. I am interested to see how how the the traffic works there, though, because yeah. there are fewer places to park. I'm not going to say parking play, parking spaces, but there are fewer places to park, like on the North Slope, for example, because yeah. of the curbing. There's there's curbing, right? so there's not there's there's more formal spaces. Okay, cars. We haven't we haven't removed. You no, know, there's when you would go. To the hill previously, there's that parking area at the top of the hill. Mm -hmm. It will have, um, you know, I think four handicapped spots and a number of, I want to say 30 um, traditional vehicular spaces, and as well as bus parking on the right hand side. How many were there before? Hey, don't, don't, don't ask me these questions. <laughs> okay. ask, you, can right. call, you call Jason Martz. Okay. He will tell you the number of spaces. He'll tell you, you know, how uh, the width between the, the he'll, he'll just yeah. rattle this off. Okay. Right. I think, I think he's become more little round top than man at this point. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but what you're, what you're hitting is there's less informal parking, right? Yes. So we used to be able to just kind of pull off the side of the road and get out. You can't do that anymore. Right. So there's one lane. And the idea is to funnel traffic up to the, the formal parking at the top of the hill. Now, there's also the gravel parking lot at the intersection of Sykes, or Sedgwick and Wheatfield mm-hmm. that we're talking about formalizing to a degree to make that um, not only overflow parking, but a uh, trailhead parking as well. No restrooms down there, though. Uh, there will be a, a Porta Johns. Porta Johns. But, okay, yeah. but they're not putting it. I, I remember there was. Uh, oh, yeah. There was yeah. at one point in this project, it was, you know, it was, it was grandiose. <laughs> you know, going to have a little you know, restrooms and a little bus parking area. Right. And, you know, vending machines and this, that, and the other thing. That That's not, that's okay. not happening. That's, that's dead. All right. So what else then? What can people expect? Uh, this, we're almost done. We're like halfway done with uh, winter lecture season already. Yeah. I can't believe that. It goes so fast. It does go. It went surprisingly fast this year. I don't it, know why. I guess, uh, you know, I, I don't know why. I don't either. Um, but it, but it, uh, it's it been an enjoyable uh, season so far. And uh, it, it definitely makes the winter go by quicker, which this is why I always look forward to the winter yeah. lecture season, because it's something to do on Saturday and Sunday. And before you know it, there's another one. Yeah. And, you know, um, well, first off, kudos to you. And, Thank and you. Your crew, you've done such a tremendous job of filming these for us, far beyond something that, that anything that we could produce in park. Thanks. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I take great satisfaction in reading the comments on the YouTube videos, commending your work and how, uh, so do how I. expertly, <laughs> I'm sure you do, how expertly you've, uh, you've, you've done it. And uh, I'm certainly very appreciative because what that Thanks. does at a, at a very basic kind of uh, basic level is it, it creates something that is very ephemeral and gives it a shelf life. And I really value that. I really value the work that you've done. Thanks. I, I'd be loath to not plug a couple of upcoming lectures. If you sure, you know, by me. all means. So uh, coming up this Saturday, we have a guy named Chris Davis. Now, Chris Davis is the supervisory biologist of the park. Oh, yes. So he's in charge of the flora and the fauna and the native and the non-native species that um, call Gettysburg home. And he's going to give a talk on the biology of the battlefield, which is a little bit different from what we normally offer. But if you've got uh, folks that are interested in learning about that aspect of the park, which intersects with the, the historical aspect quite a bit, um, I highly encourage you to go to Chris's talk. He's an exceptional guy, excellent speaker. And whether you're just interested in biology or you might be taking the licensed battlefield guide exam later in the year, this is great, great stuff for you to, to be exposed to. So okay. Chris Davis. Coming up next week, the week after, um, we have the uh, Michelle Crowell is her name. Oh, yes. And she is in charge of the Civil War Manuscript Collection at the Library of Congress. So she's going to speak about uh, Lincoln. What What is left to learn from the archival record about Abraham Lincoln? And then the following day, which is a Sunday, which is February the 18th, Ranger Matt Atkinson uh, is delivering his uh, lecture on sickles in the New York Monument Commission. So that was one that had been rained out or snowed, snowed out, out, snowed out, yep. that, we, uh, that we had to reschedule. Coming up later on, there is... Um, it's a it's a performance from uh, a woman who portrays Harriet Tubman, mm. and it's 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 more theatrical than what we we've traditionally done. So when you go for this uh, particular lecture, this this woman inhabits Harriet Tubman. So you'll be uh, basically watching a, a one woman show, which again is a little bit unique, not quite in keeping with what we've done in the past. But I think it's going to be fantastic. But the following day is a Sunday, the the twenty fifth. We'll have uh, Scott Hartwig, who's the author of, well, a number of, of books, but uh, most recently, I Dread the Thought of the Place, The Battle of Antietam. Yeah. And I'll be, um, I'll be basically, it'll be more of a QA and a uh, conversation that I'll have with, with Mr. Hartwig about the process of, of writing the book, uh, you know, some of the, the things he's learned about the battle and the battlefield of Antietam. And again, the process of doing history, how you write a 900-page book. Hmm. Um, and so I'm, I'm very excited about that. And then... The last lecture is on March the 2nd. That's me. I'll be talking about Camp Letterman. And, uh, that that should be interesting. You know, speaking of Camp Letterman, I had a neighbor where, at my, yeah. the, where I used to live, and he was he was an interesting guy. And he one day came over, and he was all uh, beside himself because, yeah. you know, they're, build, they're putting, you know, whatever the hell they're putting up their gas stations and yeah. Uh, yeah. shopping centers and apartments and stuff at Camp Letterman. He goes, oh, I don't understand why the park service – doesn't come in and uh, take that, you know what I mean? Sure. And I said, well, they can't just come in and take that. I mean, you know, it's a whole that's, big thing. That's frowned upon. Us. Yeah. <laughs> we <laughs> tried that. Little, People don't like government just stealing land. Yeah. But 
uh, you know, for, for people who might have thought the same thing, yeah. can you explain to them just how difficult or near to impossible it might be in some cases for the park to go in and do that, even with the help of, help of someone like the American Battlefield sure. Trust? And, like, how does that all work? Because I know people seem very confused, like, with Pickett's yeah. Buffet, for example, like how that all works together. Sure, sure. The, you know, the first thing I'll say is that I recognize that in any community, there are people that live here, mm. and they need things. They need restaurants to go. They need gas stations. They need grocery stores. They need, you name it. And, and so you, you know, you can't at a, at a basic level, you can't save everything. Right. So you need to be, you need to be, obviously strategic. And you know, I'd love at a, at, you know, you, you're talking to the wrong guy. So you know, I'd love, I wish we could just save everything. Right. right? Yeah. And, you know, I, yeah, that's, simply, that's not the reality. <laughs> they're they're. Even in the earliest days of the park, and by earliest days, I mean as early as, you know, John Batchelder, who's writing in the 1870s and 1880s, there was, there was a recognition that that was a, a special place. You know, Batchelder himself, you know, visits the hill and calls it this beautiful spot. And um, so there's that, you know, the recognition that, that that was part of the Gettysburg story. Mm-hmm. With, um, and there are actually, as early as the War Department, there are people writing the John Page Nicholson, who's the chairman of the, the Battlefield Commission at that point in time, saying, you know, what can you do to save what they were calling Hospital Woods? And it ultimately, there's a, a War Department marker that's placed there, but yeah. there's no formal effort to ever save it. So the Park Service, I mean, we can't just go out and, and buy stuff, right? right? Buy land. That's just not really how we work. What what is um, What happens is, you know, Congress gives you a boundary, a congressional boundary, and, you know, they draw it on a map. And I'm simplifying this sure. immensely. Yeah. But they, you know, here's your boundary. Now, that boundary, that doesn't mean that you actually own everything in it. But that's how big you can get. That's how much land you can buy. In other words, available. if after the park is started, what's the word I'm yeah. looking for? Not, uh, not started, but you know what I mean. They have an expansion boundary. So if you're going to expand, this is as far yeah. out as you can go. This is as far as you right. can go. So you're authorized but it doesn't to buy mean anything you, within that boundary. You have to. Now, if let's say there's a property that's really valuable. You got to have it. You that takes an act of Congress for huh. the, your, your boundary to be adjusted for you to be able to to purchase that land and add it to the park. Has the park ever done that and to oh, your we, knowledge? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's called a boundary adjustment. Okay. Um that is um usually it's done for small small parcels, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Camp Letterman is not in our congressional boundary. It's not. So you would have. So the first thing you would have to do is a have an interest in getting it, and then b get Congress. Yeah. To extend that, your boundary. In the case of that Letterman site, that would not happen. No. Not happen. So now let me ask you this. Now with ABT, American yeah, Battlefield. Okay, that's where I was going to go. You know they they preserve battlefield land, right? Oh. And does does Camp Letterman does that fall under that umbrella? And then the other that's thing is you got to you got to look at. Um, you know the the integrity of the site and visitor access and a, a whole host of other things. And really, like what? It's a field. Now you could say, well, the battlefield's a field, but we preserve that. Sure. Well, yeah, but there's monuments and stuff like that. But also, there's a story that unfolded on the field. Not that there's not a story that unfolds in hospitals. You know, Certainly like not. obviously, there's you know doctors do. Yeah. Here's where the surgery was. Here's where whatever the case yeah. may be. But it's a little different though from a battlefield because it's not, uh, you know what I'm saying? I don't yeah. know how, but it, well, it's just, it's people recovering and convalescing and they're laying there theoretically, or at least that's the way the public would look at it. So, you know, one, one of the things that I think that our country had, has failed at, at a, at a, in a certain aspect. And by, by this, I mean a century ago, there's this golden age of, of battlefield preservation that occurs really in the 1880s and 1890s, and this right. is when a lot of the, the you know, grand national military parks are created. So, you know, Chickamauga and Vicksburg and Shiloh and Gettysburg, these, um, these grand military parks. And the emphasis was always on the battlefields, scenes of armed conflict. Mm-hmm. And collectively, for a great period of time, that's kind of how Americans remembered the American Civil War is through battlefield parks. Right. Which, of course, I mean, is, is a hugely important story aspect of the American Civil War. But 
there's a lot of other socio and so uh, economic and political and social aspects of the war too that we we weren't as good at at preserving land associated with that so right, okay slave cabins and um <laughs> right right all the all the all, ancillary things yeah, that go along with it yeah right and it's just now within my lifetime that especially the park service has taken an increased interest in preserving those sites which is fantastic so yeah. for example you know, Fortress Monroe in the Virginia Peninsula is now a National Park Service site, uh, arguably where you know contrabands uh, come to be through the work of Benjamin Butler. Uh, Reconstruction National Historical Park down in um, down in South Carolina, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. There's sure. a whole uh, Camp Nelson where our good friend Steve Fon mm-hmm. works. Mm-hmm. There's all these parks that are now telling a much more complete story of the American Civil War, and also you know battlefield parks they they tended to be up until relatively recently a place where you know, the the heroic story of, of combat was told where um, you know we focused a lot on the military maneuvers and and um, the the tendency to shy away from the ugliness of war was kind of reinforced by the fact that we're preserving these battlefield parks only it's um you know arguably preserving a hospital site it's a very different story yeah. right it's it's one of of suffering and you know uh, certainly a different kind of hero in the form of the the medical staff and the nurses and, and but equally vital to understanding the the civil war in, in its full dimension and holistically um so you know i wish if if i had a time machine i would go back in time and i would tell john batchelder and john page nicholson and william robbins and all these folks that are fundamental to the creation of this battlefield park that that sites like Camp Letterman should be preserved in, in full. Yeah. And I, I think you know, obviously there's recognition that, that that place is significant, but I think at the same time, you know, they're assuming these places are always going to be agricultural. They're always going to be rural. Right. They'll put the War Department tablet up. And they did that at the Second Corps and the Fifth Corps Field Hospital. You can drive down Hospital Road, you'll see those. Oh, yeah. Um, and the areas around there are still relatively rural. They haven't been developed. Um, right. Like, uh, you know, a 30 heading out east from town. Which they is, never uh, could have foreseen Walmarts and no, Giants and no, gas stations. No, no, probably not. You go to a, a park like Antietam, I mean, uh, in the past 30 years, Antietam has almost doubled in size. Yeah. When, the, when that park is being laid out, the federal government really only owned enough space to put an avenue down. So the presumption was it's always going to be agricultural. But um, I mean, the reality is that's not the case. Not the so case. now they're buying up land and and what have you, but um, you know, Letterman's a it's, a, it's a tremendous story. It is, and I, I always thought that Letterman, at least, or at least a portion of it should be preserved to to honor the man it's named after and his contributions to the way. Really? I mean, we still use triage today, and you know, his whole system is, his, the world uses it. His, his system for dealing, yeah, for evacuating the wounded, for getting them treatment is still, uh, is still basically, so if you're wounded in Afghanistan or Iraq today, the, the basic process of taking you from the battlefield to a medical facility is essentially the same as, as yeah. what he created during the American Civil War. And there's this wonderful quote from a man named Paul Hawley, who was in charge of the medical uh, operations for the Allied forces at you know, Operation Torch in North Africa and then in Normandy, uh, who basically said, you know, he thanked God every day for Jonathan Letterman during the Second World War because that was the same process they were using mm-hmm. then to deal with the wounded, be it at you know, the Battle of the Bulge or... Yeah, uh, Monte Cassino or elsewhere. Which, uh, and I know you got other things you want to talk about, and we'll get to them real quick. But you know, it's funny. Th- this is something I've noticed uh, a lot of conversations that I'm hearing. And by the way, if you're waiting in the phone queue, just keep waiting. We'll get to you when Chris is I'm done. Talking because... to you. I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. I'm talking too much. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll we'll I'm get just to rambling. Four seven one seven four two zero nineteen seventy eight is the number if you want to get in the queue. Um, so. Uh, the, the you know in this day and age where you hear a lot of talk about or concern about people taking statues down i hear a lot of people saying we should put up a statue to x mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. um the or they but it more like the park should put up a statue to <laughs> x right and then i'll be like wow they're not going to do that but well, it's not my job to do that right it's not your it's right not my job to do that but but the but is there a moratorium on statues or monuments and things like that in the park mm-hmm. So no more. It's done. So um, there's a, a document that stems from 2006, Management Policies in the National Park Service. And in that document, it, um, it defines and enunciates a moratorium on monuments at Civil War battlefield parks, with the exception of those that may not have been um, able to be recognized or commemorated for whatever reason. 
in the past. And what, what we're really saying is, for example, USCT units or um, the African American contribution or the enslaved. Of course, it's it's that's a policy. It's not a law. It's a policy. Right. These things are legislated. So if Congress decides, or the American people rather, uh-huh. decide through their duly elected representatives that they want a monument to X or a memorial to Y, and Congress passes it, it becomes law. The Park Service then um, can do it. Well, we we work with the folks. You know, I mean, I'm not going to be out there chiseling something, <laughs> right? The, ideally, yeah. they create a commission of some yeah. sort, and um, similar to how you know the Eisenhower Memorial on the National Mall was created, they create a commission. Uh, the commission accepts submissions and one's decided upon and then there's funding involved and uh, ultimately it's placed. So uh, like a lot of other things, there's a lot of rigmarole to go through to get it to happen. And it should. It should be different. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. But it's not impossible. It can happen. You just got to really be dedicated to whatever you think there should be a monument it, to. It, ne- it needs to be done in Congress. Yeah. And okay. You need to go through your, your representative. All right, Chris, what else have you got to uh, dazzle I us got, with? I got a couple things. So one, um, this Saturday, actually, from 9 to 11, we're hosting something called Sensory Friendly Morning in the Museum and Visitor Center. Uh, and I'm very grateful to our partners, the Gettysburg Foundation, for making this uh, event free. Mm-hmm. So if you go between 9 and 11, you can visit the museum galleries for free. You can see the cyclorama for free. We're going to have the lights up in the cyclorama so you can see the whole canvas all at once. The, the audio uh, and sound in the uh, lobby and in the cyclorama and in the galleries will be turned down and be turned off. And the intent being to make this an opportunity for anyone with sensory sensitivities, be it uh, you know, auditory, be it, um, be it whatever. Visual. Visual, yeah. yeah. Anyone with sensitivities to have a more relaxed, a quieter morning where they can take it in. Or if you just like museums that are quiet and, mm. and a little bit more relaxed. Because, you know... The, the cyclorama show, the audiovisual show, is meant by design to be very immersive. And so, you know, there's sound effects that yeah. are, you know, 360 degrees. And we found, especially with folks with, with PTSD, it's a, it's a, it can be overwhelming. Sure. Or folks uh, or young people on the autism spectrum. And so this is an attempt by us to make sure that um, you know, they can have a positive experience when they come and they visit the park. And again, it's free open to the public for anybody who wants to show up and attend. And, and again, take your time through the museum galleries in a bit more of a relaxed manner. This is the second year in a row you've done that? This is the second year, and this is the third time we've offered it. And each time we've done it, we've had over 100 people come in for this between 9 and 11. So it's only, we're only talking about two hours. That's pretty and good. It's fantastic. Yeah. I love it. And there's actually a... We're going to be featured in a, which what's called National Parks Traveler Magazine. I hope I'm getting that right. They've done a wonderful write-up on it for us, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased. I'm really pleased with uh, the public reaction to it, and and uh, how many people we see coming through the door that maybe in another scenario would not have would not have decided to go to Gettysburg. The public reaction uh, that I've heard f- uh, about it has been very positive. People really like. I'm it. glad to hear that. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. I I haven't checked it out because I don't, you know. I don't have any of those issues, and you're I don't want to take ready. up. Well, the, you're too busy getting ready to film for me. Getting, oh, that's right. It's right, right before you're setting up. I mean, <laughs> that's right. you're otherwise engaged. Well, last year I wasn't, so. but you know this. But I mean, I figure you know. Well, you know, I've I've been through it before, sure. and sure. I, don't, I don't need sure. to. Sure. But I, I am kind of interested to see what it would be like without sounds and lights, and you know, during so during maybe I'll come a little early during COVID. Um, when you, when you go in our museum galleries in particular it's very loud a lot of sound bleed yes and um it it can be a lot there was a time mid-covid where we to kind of force people to spread out we shut the movies down so you couldn't just stand there and watch the movie Mm -hmm. you keep kind of moving i I, I loved it because it was much uh, i could talk to people you know i could talk to people in the galleries it was easier to be heard and um Again, I like uh, we didn't invent this concept. We stole it, to be honest, from other museums. But well, we whatever. It to At least you're it. doing it. And it, we've been very we've been very pleased with how it's um, been received. I have to say, the way my, I have old man hearing, so like if I'm watching one of those videos, mm-hmm. I actually hear the audio from the one on the other side of the I, wall. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. You're the same way. There's a there's a point in the galleries where you can hear all three <laughs> videos yes, at once. So yes. you're hearing day one, day two, day three. Yeah. At the same at time. the same time. Yeah. But what's interesting is that's uh, it's Scott. I'm, exag- I'm exaggerating, but only no, slightly. Yeah. 
But it's Scott Hartwig narrating. Yes, he is. He, he narrates throughout. Yeah. Any other famous Park Service people that people might want to listen for in that gallery when we hear voices? There's a couple of so you go. There's a we call it an interactive where you can um, select um, voices of secession. Sure. You know what are people saying in 1860, 1861? Now, I know one of those uh, voices is a man by the name of John Heiser, who was a former we know him. Uh, historian. Yep. I believe uh, there's a, a former ranger named Chuck Teague. We know him as uh, well. He, he's, yeah. he's featured there. Uh, in the um, Soldier Life Gallery, you can do a little bugle call uh, uh, interactive. And you probably don't know this name, but he was the chief ranger here for a long time. His name's Brian Fitzgerald. You can hear. I know him. You can hear his voice. Yeah. You know. Oh, that's uh, interesting. Okay, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, because he was working here at the time that the, it yeah. was all being put together yeah, yeah. with Scott, so that right. makes sense. That's right. When I opened Getty's Bike Tours, Brian was the guy I went when I got the permit. Oh yeah, he was the guy that was I went into, guy. and he laid down the law for me. He's like, "All right, that, listen, that here are the rules." Like Ranger Fitzgerald. <laughs> yeah, yeah I really like him. He was um they, that whole crew, John Heiser, Scott Howard. Yeah. Brian Fitzgerald, they they left this park a much better place than they found it. Well, and you learned under Scott, I, right? They were they yeah. 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 And it shows too, by the well, way. It shows. That's, um I very kind of you to say that. What else? Okay, so oh yeah, we have a lot. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm getting sidetracked. Um, well, you're the I'll, one who's I'll pressed for yeah, time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll move through this quickly. So, living history will resume uh, beginning in May. And so we have a host of different living history organizations that we've worked with. We welcome into the park. They provide uh, encampments, firing demonstrations, and it's um, Matt Atkinson's heading up that program for us now, and he's, uh, I think, not quite every weekend, but almost every weekend between May and October. You'll see that in the park. That kicks off uh, in the beginning of May. May 11th, it's a Saturday. We're going to do a program we called Open Doors in the mm, past. I love we that. allow yes. access into select park buildings. So we've committed to doing that. We, we, we didn't do it last year. And uh, actually, the previous years, because of, of COVID, we didn't do it. But so many people reached out to us saying, "Hey, are you going to do, are you going to do open doors again?" That you know, we, I don't think we realized that it made that big of an impression on 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 the visitors. So, I'm not going to say what buildings yet, because we're still working on that. But we will be doing open doors again. That's uh, great. May 11th, which is a Saturday, in in conjunction with Historic Preservation Month. I did it. I guess it was 2019 the last time you did it. I think probably. Yeah, yeah I think that's uh, when I went through it, and I thought it was the coolest thing. I don't remember it being done when I lived here between 05 and 10. No, no, we we created you that created program, that. Yeah. Okay, I think it's a great program. And you know, I remember going in the McPherson barn, yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know, it was an empty barn. There was nothing in there. But it was so cool was to true. go into the McPherson <laughs> you are, barn, Yeah, but you're right? inside. You're inside the barn. Yeah. And I th I don't know what it is because, uh, you know, I, I know there's other people out there like me in this regard. And it's just something seemingly small like that, getting to walk through the threshold of doors sure. that are normally closed yeah. It uh, here, it does something that maybe, I mean, I, I still don't know why I think it's so cool. Like, I can't explain it. It's just well, a cool... It, it You know, um, I think that gets back to what we were talking about a little round top earlier, where people have this, I think, fundamental desire to connect with things that are real. And, yeah. Um, when you walk into that barn, you're in the barn. Well, and it makes it more real. Otherwise, yeah. it, it could just be a movie set. It's yeah. just a facade, yeah, a right? Facade. But then you go in and you see the nicks in the three floor. Three and you three-dimensional. Yeah. yeah three you see life having been lived in exactly, there at one yeah. point, and yeah. that's what's so interesting you know, you about see, it. You, you, you're looking at the battlefield park, the battlefield from a different perspective. Yeah. And so, I, I, you know, it's, it's very gratifying that, that so many people love that that program, and I thank everybody that reached out to us. So we will be bringing that back on, on the May uh, 11th. On May 25th, um, we're hosting a panel evening panel discussion on uh, PTSD in the American Civil War. And we're really working with a lot of licensed battlefield guides, uh, Rob Abbott, oh, Rick Schrader, good. Tracy Bear, uh, and a few others to make that that happen. Uh, because, you know, they're, they've won. They, 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 they come from military and medical backgrounds, and they've done this before. Yeah. I think they actually were on your We your, did a show, show about PTSD. I stole that's, that from you. Um, that's fine. I just, I just that's ripped fine. it off from you because I thought it was so great. I get. And, uh, I still get so many good emails from veterans about that episode. So, Well, you should come in and be part of it. Oh, I would love to. But, I mean, I, well, I don't know what I could add to the – I mean, I, you know – We'll, I talk, just, we'll talk. We'll talk. Okay. We'll talk. All right. about yeah. But I'm uh, very grateful. To I would them. like to, since you stole the idea <laughs> from me, Chris. Stole, yeah. <laughs> like most of my things. <laughs> not that only that, but all the people for. I had on the show. <laughs> Do you want Pastor Andy Hart? Did you get him? I, I think he's actually coming to that. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> to that. So it's my full cast. Yeah, yeah. Besides you, I'm replacing you. <laughs> 
well, I will all, be I'll be playing the role of Matt Callery today. <laughs> all I did on that one, I I, uh, I remember uh, uh, Rob Abbott was very concerned about us coming off the right way. He didn't. Absolutely, he yeah. didn't want us to come off as people trying to give advice, mm -hmm. or as any kind of professionals who could, you know, comment on that. But we just wanted to, you know, use the words of the soldiers to describe this, so that mm -hmm. guys today going through it could see that guys back then went through it. I think intellectually or academically, we all know they had to have. Yeah. But here they are describing it in their Victorian ways, mm -hmm. or here's descriptions of someone else going through it, and you yeah. know. And I remember because of Rob's concern, that kind of scared me a little bit. And I was like, you know what, Rob, you why don't you take the lead on this one? Because I'll I'll just kind of sit there and just kind of help move it along. Yeah. But um, I think you, you know, being a Marine Colonel, mm -hmm. I think maybe you are more qualified to to lead this charge, so to speak. And so, <laughs> it's, so um, that's what I did as I sat back and mm -hmm. you know, you know, it's obviously an important topic. It's one that's not to be taken lightly, no. and as you note, it's it's one that is not new or novel to our day and age. But you can, and I don't want to attempt to diagnose people from the past, but I think there there are a lot of um, commonalities between that that experience during the American Civil War and, and today. And yeah, I'm very grateful to these guys for being willing to to participate in it again. Yeah, and um, <laughs> contain. I will say, continue the conversation that you so so nobly started. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so we'll be doing that. Yeah. Okay. And then on um, June, I believe it's June the 9th, we will be welcoming a historian by the name of Ronald C. White for a free public lecture. Uh, he he recently published a book on Joshua Chamberlain. Okay. And so, um, you know, in conjunction with, uh, you know, obviously the reopening of Little Round Top that'll be occurring around that time, we're very excited to welcome him. Mm -hmm. He also he will also be speaking at the Civil War Institute, which you note. All right. And that's it? Well, we'll also be doing our programming, our field programming. So as we leave the, the winter lecture series behind, we head out on the battlefield. And so I, I would anticipate, you know, battle walks and um, a variety of, of field programs. So you say I would anticipate. Do you, do you have a, a, a schedule yet or at least a, a rough idea of how, when people can expect these? Not specific we usually, dates. We usually but start like, up field programming in April. So in April, April 1, I'd look for that. Okay. So you, you, but you don't have. I'm playing and I'm playing and playing. Play my cards close to my You're, you're holding them close to the vest. Okay, good. You don't I'll want to make another sure I got my ducks in a row. You know what you should. I don't maybe... want you to be doing. You know, <laughs> exactly. Get back at me. These exactly. Battle walks. I might steal some of your walk ideas. Don't do that. No, I'm just kidding. I usually steal your ideas. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. I'm gonna get Lewis Trot to come do some <laughs> hikes for us. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. Anything else you want to add before we go to the calls? Uh, no. Okay. No, by all means. All right, and then we'll do that now with uh, Mike, who has been patiently waiting here. You know, I have a, a talk to text mm -hmm. a screener here, but it doesn't always get what people are saying. I want to tell you, it says, uh, this is what Mike supposedly said, and then we'll see what he actually wants to say. It says, Mike, I have a question about the installation of camp, quote, may have changed. It's a fog raffy of the park. So let's see what he actually said. That, Mike, you're on the I air. I know exactly what he's talking about. I do, too. Mike, hello. Well, howdy, Matt. Hi. Howdy, Matt. Hello, Chris. Hey there. How are you? Okay. How, how are you guys? Doing great. Great. Yeah, I don't know what that gibberish was just <laughs> read off. But, you know. Don't worry we about it. We've got to do something about this AI stuff. Yeah, I know, right? So my, what's up, Mike? My, que my question was, I've, I've walked uh, Pickett's Charge a number of times, different angles, and, you know, used uh, one or two of the guidebooks. I forget which one. But it did seem to be pretty accurate. Landscape seemed pretty much unchanged because, as you got as as the Confederate troops would have got down into some of those swales, see where they did have cover for a few moments. Mm -hmm. But I can't help but think that when that big army camp went in in the beginning of the 20th century, they you know they erected some wooden structures. I, I would think they would have probably bull, bulldozed some of the tops of some of the ridges and therefore that the landscape may have been significantly changed, but I don't know. I've always wondered about that and never got a satisfactory answer. 
that. But anyway, I'll, I'll hang up and listen to what you guys so, have. So, what, yeah. what exactly is the question? Did the landscape, the, the landscape okay. change? So, that, first of all, thanks, Mike, yeah. for that question. Yeah, you would think that the installation of Camp Colt yeah. changed the landscape of the fields of tickets charged. Sure, thank yeah. you. All right, thanks, Mike. Thanks for so, the uh, question. Go ahead, Chris. So, yeah, you go out there today, and you it's not difficult to, tr- you know, in your mind to imagine you know, pickets charge and folding across that landscape. Uh, most visitors, you know, kudos to Mike for, um, for you know, hiking the battlefield and, and reading up on it because uh, most visitors don't, don't realize that at you know, one point in time there is this U.S. military installation called Camp Colt that's really smack dab in the middle of the field. And they have a variety of, um, of, of structures that they erect, pr- primarily, as you know, it's wooden barracks. But, you know, there's also there's an officer swimming pool that's yeah. right near the, the angle. And there's you know, some more permanent structures, obviously. Yeah. At one point in time, there's, you know, there's a rail line going up there. And um, so you know, what, I, what I always tell visitors is that you can't build that kind of facility without altering the landscape. No, sure. I would say these these are not major alterations, but they certainly change the overall topography of that land. Yeah, because um, it involves grading and involves you know laying out of avenues and company streets and camp 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 streets. So that there are changes in the the overall topography. How how f- significant they are though, I think is is um. You can still go out there, and you can still understand. The, the terrain that Pickett's men would have encountered. So those big swales that'll that'll hide a division or hide a brigade, they're still there. You can yeah. hack that trail and you can you can experience what they experience. Right, when right. You, when you know when you leave the point of woods and you follow that kind of mode path. And granted you're kind of on the far, far left of what would have been Garnett's brigade. Uh, you go down that, that swale still and you can see where, you know, there's enough concealment there. You can't see the Union position on Cemetery Ridge and then you crest the Raj by the Emmitsburg Road. And, um all of a sudden the Union line is is right there. So yeah. that is still that is still something that you can experience and see out on the battlefield. But when they when they created Camp Cold, they certainly changed some of those smaller topographical features that um, you know gave way to that that military camp. And of course, it's I mean they're they're using, it's a tank training ground that they're they're sure. They're, they're, there's images of them using the um the the, 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 the ramp, ramp of the, uh, the, the bliss bliss barn, barn yeah as the, you know this is proving ground for these Renault <laughs> tanks that um. We don't do that today, obviously, uh, but certainly they did in the, in the 19 teens. Well, and, and I guess for, for for tanks, you wouldn't want it to necessarily necessarily be all flat. You know, no, you would you would keep to, some of yeah, those you, swales in there anyway. Like you wouldn't again, obliterate they're, they're, it all. They're, those, those swales that again provide real cover and concealment for for pickets and men. They're, they're substantial. Yeah. Those, those yeah. Significant undulations in the ground. That, yeah. Um, you know, they, they they remain out there today. Uh, Bob from Annapolis, you are on the air, sir. Hey, how y'all doing today? Good, hey, good. Bob. How about yourself? Good, good. Uh, I just want to say thank you, Chris, for these updates, and thank you, Absolutely. Matt, for allowing him to give us these updates. It's my pleasure. Very, very helpful. That's my job, sir. Um, <laughs> there you go. My question was about Wolf's Hill and basically access to it, and if anything, I, I'm never really comfortable going there and trying to figure out how to get there, what mm. the proper procedure is. And if there's if any um, plans to make that easier or or what over there. Because like I said, I'd love to get there, but I'm just not sure exactly what I need to do to get there. You're talking about Neal Avenue or Lost Avenue? You want to go out yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, Chris? Well, to that point, so when we're talking about public access to, to Neal Avenue, um, one, I'd say, if, if you ever have the chance to go up there, yeah. and it's amazing up there. Yeah, it's, it's cool. It's, it's one of the areas of the battlefield that when you when you go up there, it's very 19th century. Yeah. It's, it's a time capsule. It's untouched. Yeah. It's a time capsule. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the credit to that is due to the, the man that owns most of the land around it, a gentleman by the name of Dean Schultz, who is incredibly gracious with his time and is, is always very willing to, um, to escort folks out there, I mean, provided you, you contact him ahead. Yeah. So here's what I would say. So if you want to access Neal Avenue, the single best thing you can do is we'll call the Museum and Visitor Center. And uh, Dean has, has uh, given us permission to distribute his, his phone number. Okay. And so make contact with him. I mean, he's, he, he works. He's, you know, he's got his own life, so do it ahead of time. But he uh, he's usually very good about allowing you to park in his driveway, which is along the Baltimore Pike, right? And then to access the hill from from that direction. There's a old um, uh, right of way at the end of Clapsaddle Road, which I would would not encourage you to um, 
to, to, mm-hmm. to go that route. Uh, one, it's it's not maintained, it's abandoned. Two, it's surrounded by private property, and we want to be respectful of, of the folks that live up there. Now, someday, some future iteration, uh, when perhaps we own a, a bit more of, of um, you know, a bit more parcels around that that area, I, I love for a, a trail system to be able to connect these kind of uh, distant elements of the park into one cohesive. That would be awesome. Cohesive, uh, yeah, yeah, cohesive uh, system. But that what a dream to be seen. <laughs> that would be something else. I retire in 2042, so maybe by by that point we'll, we got some time. Yeah, I got a little bit of time. I got a little bit of time. But yeah, I would contact Dean Schultz in the event you want to go out there. Bob, what else were you gonna say? No, that's it. I just, like I said, I, I didn't know where to park. I didn't sure. know, you know, I don't want to go out there and have some somebody chase me off their property. No, with a no, no. I, you know, <laughs> right. there are a lot of people that just go out there and you know try to bush that whack their way up. And you know, um, kudos to you for trying to do it the right way. It's much better for everybody else. Oh, thank you. I'll tell you. We, thank uh, you. You've been very helpful. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for the call. Um, I went I um, a years ago when I first moved here, 2018. My friend Dustin and I. We, I had just taken that tour with Troy about, uh, you know, and but it wasn't even about park roads that are no longer there. It was just, you know, that's where I learned it. And that's when I became obsessed. And then Dustin came down a couple of weeks later and I showed him and we went to a couple of other yeah. ones and we went into the visitor center and I asked the ranger on duty. I said, so where are these, where are other hidden roads? Mm-hmm. You know, and he goes, what are you talking? Lost Avenue? And I go. I'd never heard of it at that point. Oh, and I was you, like, your, your no, but now deep. I want to know. Yeah, yeah. So he gave us <laughs> You had Dean's... my curiosity, but now you have my <laughs> yeah, attention. Right, exactly. <laughs> so now uh, he gives us Dean's number, yeah. and we call Dean, and we leave a voicemail, and he calls us back, and he tells us where to come. And I thought he was going to just say, yeah, just go back up there. Oh, you can't miss you, it. No, he took us up yeah. there and spent two and a half hours with us. Yeah. And we we were we were like in nerd heaven. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's there's a sign that says the right flank of the Army of the right. Potomac up there, extreme right or whatever. Yeah. I forget how they word it. But these monuments that I had never seen before. And my favorite monument is up there. Seventh Main. Yes. That's everybody's favorite. It's everybody's it's favorite. It's but it's like the coolest one. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Cool. And so I, I just think it's uh it's amazing uh there. Uh all right, who is this here? Um okay. Matt, or is this I don't know, six one four is the number that uh, the area code there. You're on the air. Oh, looks like he just hung up. Oh no, but here we go. We got somebody in the queue here. I'm not gonna I'm going to interrupt their screening. Uh, 585, you are on the air. I interrupted your screening. Go ahead. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello? Hello, yes, there you are. (laughs) Hi, it's Jean Hutchinson calling. Hi, Jean, how are you? I'm pretty good. I'm just calling with a question for Chris about the battle locks that they have every year over the anniversary. Go yeah. for it. He's being very secretive about them, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I just wondered if they had ever thought about sprinkling them through the rest of the summer, especially like into October when the tourists seem to descend upon Gettysburg and the weather is cooler. And I just wondered if they ever thought about doing that. Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so we we have them throughout the um, throughout the summer into the fall. Usually, it all depends on staffing, of course. How many how many people I can hire, and how many um, you know how many rangers I can put out in the yeah. field. Uh, so you know, I, I'd love to get well, to a I, point I where. Know, we're, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I, I know you have the history hikes and the first, second, third day of battle, but I really love the big long battle walks that you guys yeah. do over the anniversary. So we we do do them. Over the summer, still, uh, they usually on the weekends we do them. But I hear what you're saying. You want you want more, and you want to extend them into the fall. And um, well, again, it's all dependent on staffing. Yeah. But I'm very fortunate, actually, this year, in particular, that I got a very good crew of um, uh, of rangers, both permanent and um, my seasonal team. Great, coming back. Got a lot of good people. Do you have the seasonal team? How, when do you pick the seasonal teams? That this time of year. Uh, we do hiring, yeah. We do hiring yeah. now, and it all depends on how much hiring I do. Depends on how many vacancies I have. Because if you're a seasonal, you can, um, depending on how you've been hired, you have rehire rights, so I, you can keep coming back and back. Oh, that's and nice. It, what's, what's wonderful is when you get a, a good crew like we do now. Um, and I've always been very fortunate with um with the with the, the folks on my team. Uh, we have some really good people, and um, you know when they've had a few seasons under the belt and. And they start to develop that that real site specific subject matter expertise. You can do more and more 
yeah. as, a, as a park. Right, you do right. more battle walks. You do more campfires. You can do all these great things that it's, it's difficult to expect that of somebody who's, you know, just come from Acadia. You know, now they've <laughs> stepped foot into Gettysburg, and it's a very it's a different, different ball thing. game. Different, different park. It's yeah. A different ball yeah. game. Uh, Gene, any other questions you have there? Uh, no, just I'm so excited that he's going to do Doors Open Gettysburg again because I think I was down there in 2016 for it, and it was so much fun. Oh, it was glad, so amazing. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. That just well. made my day when he said that. Good. So thank you so much. Thanks for taking my call. You're welcome, Jeans. Right. Great to hear your voice. <laughs> bye bye now. All right, bye bye. Um, the uh, um, uh, 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 she brought up a good point. Oh yeah, October. Now in the town, yeah, it seems that there are, are more visitors in October than July. Yeah, it's true. Is the park seeing that as well? October is the busiest month of the year. It is. It has overtaken July. Absolutely. A lot of people and when I tell even, them it's that it's not even particularly close. Really, yeah. a lot of when I tell a lot of people that they don't believe me. They go, "But what, July was when the battle was," nope. and I go, "Nobody cares. No. <laughs> it's, it's too hot." It, well, it's um. No, I'm not saying nobody cares, but you know what? I mean? Well, I mean, I do say that, but that's not what I mean. Well, you know, visit, it's hot. It's it was very hot, yeah. right? It's very hot, and you know, there was a point in time when July, far and away, was the, the busiest month of the year. But th- but that's in the early 2000s, uh, in yeah, the 1990s, and. We were a tougher lot back then. I think. Well, I think you know visitors have changed. Yes. You know, honestly, visitors have changed. And, Absolutely. Um, you know, October is is very busy. It's almost like we have two winters now because July and August, after say Bike Week, yeah, yeah. <laughs> off a yeah. cliff, and then it picks up in September, Late and then September October, and October, it's yeah. boom. It's quite busy. Really busy until about Christmas, and then it. Falls off a cliff again yeah. until March, it, P- yeah. St. Patrick's Day. It kind of picks up a little bit, and then April bigger, and then you know. Yeah, we noticed that same thing. In the yeah, yeah, it's it's weird. So we have two winters now in Gettysburg, which is all the more <laughs> reason for you to come and visit that's during that's the summer the and the winter. <laughs> I mean, really, that's one of the beautiful things I think about. We'll start doing another winter lecture series, but it's going to be in, in the summer, be in August and September. Yeah. Why not? It, in the air conditioning, do it. Think about it. I, I'm telling you. It's such I, I let and for those of you who have not been to a winter lecture uh, and you're within an hour drive and you got looking for something to do on a Saturday or a Sunday or both, you gotta give one of one of the weekends a try. Just come on up. What I like about it, Chris, is it's it's uh well well there's a lot of things I like about it. One of them is that you have you you really do a great job at picking interesting people to come and ha- talk about an interesting topic, like you know the Thank good you. presenters. Number one, number two, uh, is it, there's a there's a core group of people that are there every lecture, yeah. right? And and I know this because I go and I record every lecture, and I've been doing it for like three or four years, and I see the same group of people yeah. all the time. And I may not talk to them, I not, may not know who they are, but it's nice to see the same this, faces. This, yeah. I I almost uh, uh, I feel like it's uh, like a kind of like a winter camp. Like a summer camp, but in the in the winter, it's a nice community you know. that's, that's it developed is. around it. I'm yeah, I'm grateful for that. Uh, Eric Houston, you are on the air, sir. Oh, actually, it might be getting Eric. You're on the air. Well, good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you, Chris, for coming on the show. Uh, great show so far. At least what I could listen to, other than when work interfered with my enjoyment. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, um, but I just wanted to, to two things. One, I wanted to thank you on behalf of my, my daughter. Uh, she's a student at the college and she said you were very gracious with your time and she enjoyed the, I think you took them on. I can't remember where you took them, but you took some of the students on the, for a, a short tour or something. So, oh, um, I don't know if it was, I think maybe a little round top you went up there. I, I took, so a, yeah, I took, a, I took a, a class, bit. um, of them up to little round top in October, I think. And that was, that was great. Yeah. Yep. 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 So she very much enjoyed that. Oh, so good. just wanted to pass along her, her thanks for you on that. Um, but a question for you, I guess, is uh, if you had, if, if re- and certainly understand resources are a major issue, but if, if resources weren't an issue, what is, what is maybe a, a dream project or, or a project that you would really like to do that, that um, hasn't been done before? Great question. That's a great question. Yeah. That's a wonderful question. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go back to um, something we t- we touched upon just briefly in our Lost Avenue discussion. If you go to Antietam, 
Antietam National Battlefield. And I think this is a lot of credit to the, the team down there led by Keith Snyder. They have what I think is one of the best trail systems in any battlefield yeah. park. Yeah. It's, it's well marked. Each trail has a purpose. They're thematic. And you can hike at Antietam from the visitor center to the North Woods down to Burnside's Bridge down to Snavely Ford. I mean, you can hike the whole battlefield. And you can you know, cross pavement only a handful of times, and it takes you to all of these locations that are off the road. Yeah. So you get a sense of the soldier experience and yeah. the terrain. Uh, that that trail system at Antietam is fantastic. It is. Before I retire in 2042. <laughs> uh, not that you're counting. Not that. No. Uh, you gotta you know get a good plan yeah. ahead. I know. I know. You're, yeah. You're gonna, you're safe. <laughs> um, before I retire, I would love to have a, a trail system that is similar to what they've done at Antietam but at Gettysburg. That, to, that would be to, great. So you can access things like, like Bushman Hill and yeah. South Cavalry Field and you know, uh, 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 Neal Avenue uh, in a way that um, is more than just being dependent on the, the avenue system and the very few formalized trails we have in the parks. So I, would, I would love that. I would love that. That would be my dream. That would be so cool. Um it's hard. It's a little harder to do here because it's a different, different, different layout, different animal for for it's, sure. But I, I think it could be done. It can be done. I know it can be done. Yeah, I have a route from Wolf Hill all the way like down across Rock Creek, along Rock Creek until you get yeah. into like uh, uh, you know uh, I can't think of the name of the road like Carmen Avenue and oh, like sure. that area there. You know, uh, and then they go up the. I got a big map of the park that I I, I sharpie you know, a little sharpie mark and I draw you know these these trails that I'd love to have. I, I probably those look like a lunatic. No one can make any sense of it other than me. <laughs> Something that you know only a lunatic would. It's would like that meme create. of uh, Charlie <laughs> yes. from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia with all the the pictures and yeah. the yarn yeah, 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 yeah. going from yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see, Eric. Anything else? Or did I already hang up? On no, that? I just uh, that. Thank you very much, and that was a that was a great idea. And I know I've become a a much wider user of the National Park Service app. And I've, as I travel for work, I try to hit different national parks and being able to use that app. Oh, yeah. And even a lot of places have interpretive trails like that, that you just open up your phone and, and follow trails around like that. And it's it would, would give a whole lot of, you know, I mean, now you can currently use it to do the driving tour, but I'm not sure. I guess I haven't really looked much, but uh, I think that'd be a great addition to have those extra trails. Right. So, be, thank you for the absolutely. thank you for the time and the answer and the question. Absolutely. Thank you for so, the call, Eric. Good you question. have yourself a great day. Uh, all right, Chris, I, I taken up too much of your time already, and I appreciate it. I know you said that you were you didn't have all the time in the world, and so I must let you go now. Wow, well, it's been a pleasure, Matt, and I want to thank you again for all the work you've done uh, supporting the park and um, My pleasure. all the work that you've done um, you've done here. It's it's been a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thank all of you for watching. Thank you for calling in, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we'll talk to you in a couple months. We'll have Chris back, and we'll see what's going on. With all that other stuff, we'll have him on before the summer so that you can maybe then he'll tell us what kind of battle walks and other outdoor activities. We'll do he's it got live planned. from the summit of Little Round Top, right? <laughs> well, yeah, we'll do one of those too. <laughs> then we'd better do one of those. That'd be awesome. Otherwise, that's it, folks. Thank you very much.